another of 2G Tuesdays. I wanna thank Michael Mantell for bringing this program to our center. Uh, it's been very successful and we're really, really excited that 2Gs are starting to share their stories. As we know, the survivors who are passing day by day and we're very lucky to have survivors among us, but we also have the next best thing. We have their witnesses, their eyewitnesses, their children. So this program is really meant to connect us all uh, in a way that previously perhaps we could not be connected. So I wanna thank Michael Mantell for uh, bringing this program every month since the, uh, the pandemic started. And I really appreciate his input and he has some announcements for you as well. So thank you, Michael, I appreciate it, take it away. Beautiful, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, so uh, thank you, Andrea, and to everyone at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center for all the great work you do every single day, educating people on the lessons of the Holocaust, investing in future generations of upstanders, and for making programs like Sundays with Survivors and 2G Tuesdays the success that they are. Thank you to everyone joining us today and those for viewing this recording. I love when I see so many familiar faces and then get to meet new people as well. So thank you all for being here. And a very special thank you to all of our guest speakers, Holocaust survivors and their families, especially Dinah Kramer, for sharing your family's testimonies with us. Welcome to 2G Tuesdays. My name is Michael Mantell. I'm a 3G, a grandchild of Holocaust survivors and the son of a Sabra, an Israeli. Uh, in 2020, I approached the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center to host a one-time private event for our families and friends. Um, Irving Roth, a Holocaust survivor, educator, and an incredible human being shared his testimony with us. The program was so successful that we decided to open it up to the public and began hosting it on a monthly basis, and thus Sundays with Survivors was born. Following the success of Sundays with Survivors, 2G Tuesdays was introduced in 2021, and we're hoping to add a 3G Thursdays program this year. Since our program began, we have lost numerous survivors, including Irving Roth, uh, Kathy Grease, and Dinah's mother, Sarah Gold. When I began these online programs, it was something that I wanted to do with each survivor and family member sharing their testimonies. And each time I heard a survivor passing, I not only wanted to do these programs, but understood the need. Today, Dinah Kramer will be sharing the testimony of her mother, Sarah Gold. Originally from Poland, Sarah survived several forced labor camps and a death march. Dinah has worked as a teacher of deaf and hard of hearing students for over 30 years. After retiring from teaching, Dinah realized how much she missed working with kids, so she became involved in Holocaust education. Initially, uh, helping her mother tell her story, now Dinah and her sister share their mother's testimony. Presenting these testimonies is not easy, and bearing witness to them can be very difficult as well. We are taken on a harrowing journey. However, these stories and the survivors instill hope in all of us. At the end of today's program, I will invite everyone to share their questions or comments during the Q&A portion. You can either raise your virtual raise hand emoji, or you can raise your actual hand. And if we don't see you or don't call on you, you may also unmute yourself to share. You can also write your questions or comments in the chat, and I can share those for you as well. As the grandson of Holocaust survivors, I am thankful for all of the survivors and their families for sharing their testimonies with us and to organizations like the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center for making events like these possible. Again, I would like to thank all of you for being here today. And if you are moved by Dinah's presentation and her mother's story, and would like to learn more about the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center and the incredible work that they do. If you would like to visit their museum, inquire about their community education programs or donate, 
please visit their website at hmtcli.org. Also, a recording of this program will be emailed to you and shared on YouTube after the conclusion of the program. I would love for all of you to re-watch this and to share it with as many people as you know. So again, thank you all for being here, especially Dinah. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce Dinah to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I'm a little overwhelmed. It's so nice to see so many people from uh, different facets of my life. Uh, as Michael said, my name is Dinah Kramer. And um, I recently began to share my mother's story with um, students using this particular format. I've tweaked this presentation a little bit because it's a different audience. So if parts of it sound a little more like I'm teaching, you'll forgive me. Um, I also wanna note that when I wrote this, I wrote the story in the third person and referred to my mother as Sarah. And as I've been presenting, I've been advised to start referring to her as my mother. So I'm going to flip back and forth. Um, and so you know that when I say Sarah or I say my mother, I'm speaking about the same person. Uh, I wanted the students to know her name. So I kept referring to her as Sarah. And also it got a little confusing when I was referring to her family members. So um, I've included video clips of my mother uh, telling her story during her Shoah tape. This was a video that was done through the Shoah Foundation and it was taped in 1997. Um, the male voice you might hear in some of the clips is her interviewer. And uh, for those of you who are on this call and knew her, this might be a little difficult. But uh, I hope you can listen to her and see her again. Okay, well, with that, I will begin. Well, okay, share sound. Give me a minute. I'm beginning. Okay. These are my parents, Sarah and Elias Gull, on their wedding day. In addition to being my wonderful, loving parents, they both survived the Holocaust. My mother spoke about her experience, but my father rarely did. And I think that's part of the reason I feel it's important to continue to tell my mother's story. My mom, Sarah Gohl, was born Sarah Albert to Hannah and Elias Pincus Albert, who was also known as Pinnock. My mom was born in Kels, Poland on November 14th, 1929, 1927, and 1931. And yes, you heard me correctly. I mentioned three different years of her birth. As you hear her story, you will understand how she was reborn with each change in her birth year. Okay, you are looking at a map of Europe before World War II. And the numbers on the map signify the pre-war Jewish population in each country. And the inset is Poland. Both of my parents, Sarah and Elias, were from Kels, Poland. Kels is a city in the center of Poland, midway between Warsaw and Krakow. Before World War II, approximately 25,000 Jews lived in Kels, accounting for one third of the population. My parents didn't know each other in Kels. They met in the United States 11 years after the war ended, but they met because they shared a connection to that city. And I will say that story for later. Sarah was the only child of Hannah and Pinnock and was the first to admit that she was very spoiled as a young girl. The, pic the bigger picture is my mom as a baby and she's being held by her father and in front of her is her mother. And the other people in the photograph are my grandmother's siblings and their uh, spouses and children. Um, and the smaller picture is my mother when she was probably about three years old and she's with um, her mother, my grandmother. When I was putting this together, I realized that we don't have uh, pictures of my grandfather's family. We only had picture, some pictures of my mother's, mother's family. When my mother was five years old, the family moved to a neighboring town, Skarzysko Kamiena, so that her parents could help in her maternal grandparents' store. These are photos of where she lived, but they were taken in 2016. 
The bottom picture is the apartment that she lived in in Kells. And the top picture is the store and the house that she lived in above the store. My mother's grandparents, Rosa and Zelig Weinrib, had a very successful dry goods store and were quite wealthy. And the family lived together above the store. The thing that my mother remembered most that was that they sold candy in large containers in the store and she couldn't wait to get the broken pieces that had melted together at the bottom and could not be sold. Her grandparents had a horse named Chestnut and they had a phone. And to give you a sense of how rare phones were at the time, their phone number was 19. And when I tell that to students, their jaws drop because they're so used to everybody having a phone in their back pocket. My mother had many cousins nearby who she would play with. It was an idyllic childhood. My mother often spoke fondly of spending time with her grandfather Zelig, who would take her for rides with a horse and buggy in the snow. And here's some more uh, family photos. And again, when I talk to the students, I explained that when you know everybody didn't have a phone in their back pocket in those days. Um, so the big picture was taken in 1919, and it was taken because her great aunt Sarah, who's circled in the picture was emigrating to the United States. Um, my mother's mother, Hannah, is on the top of that picture and Zelig and Rosa, my mother's grandparents, are circled below her mother and the great grandfather is in the center. And I chose this picture because my mother told me that in that big family picture, only three people survived the war. Uh, the bottom picture is my mother with her two cousins. And the smaller picture, if your uh, screen is not being blocked by other people, um, is my mother and her father. And that picture was taken before the war and her two little cousins. I went to Poland in 2016 and I went to the house where she lived 75 years before then. While it looks different from the street, the space in the back of the house remains largely unchanged. And when I showed my mother these pictures, she got all teary because she told me about a time when she walked out the back door and her cousin Nanek sprayed her with a water hose as she stepped out the back door. Skarziska was a small town and the Jewish population there was less than in Kells. My mother went to a school where she and one boy were the only Jewish children in the grade. Poland in those days required students to go to school six days a week. But the Jewish children did not attend school on Saturdays when they were supposed to observe the Sabbath. And despite not being in school on Saturday, they were still responsible for the work. Fortunately, my mother had older cousins who helped her stay on track. In 1935, the leader of Poland, Joseph Pulsutski, I might be saying his name wrong, he, Joseph Pulsutski died. And my mother remembered the train carrying his body passing in front of their home. You can see from the picture, there's a railroad station in front of their house. Polsudski had sought to establish a multi-ethnic Poland and actively protected minority groups, including the Jewish residents of the country. My mother always said he was good to the Jews. After he died, however, Jews faced a surge of anti-Semitism, which was also on the rise in Germany where Hitler had become chancellor. And my mother experienced some of that anti-Semitism firsthand. In 1938, people carried signs in front of the store saying, don't buy from the Jews. And I just want to point out that I was not able to find a picture of their store. So uh, these are pictures of boycotts in Germany. So it was happening all over Europe. My mother's family was still able to do business from the back door because that was out of public view. My mother told us at one time she was beaten up on her way to school because she was Jewish. And in 1939, she became ill with scarlet fever and her father saw the way anti-Semitism had infected her school. My mother was forced to quarantine for a few weeks. And her, her, when her father, Pinnock, went to meet with the teacher to get the work for her, her teacher claimed that it wasn't important for a Jewish girl to get an education and that she could just repeat the same grade the following year. My mother overheard her father telling her mother what the teacher had said, 
and she decided in the future she would prefer to attend a Jewish school. As things turned out, the war broke out that September and Jewish children were no longer permitted to go to school. September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and one week later they reached the town of Skarzysko Kamina. My mother recalled a bomb being dropped nearby, but it landed inside a well, so there was no damage. My mother said that they, they left for a few days and they thought about leaving, but they really had nowhere to go. The Nazis came and they ransacked the store and they took most of the valuable items, including the horse and the buggy. My mother's family was still able to do some business using the back door so that the Nazis would not be aware. My mother was almost 10 years old and could not go to school. Her parents hired a tutor and my mother was an avid reader and she would read anything she could get her hands on. Times were tough and the family struggled, but they stayed put, hoping things would return to normal once the war ended. They could not imagine what was to come. On May 5th, 1941, a ghetto was established in Skorzysko not too far away from where they were living. Again, I could not find pictures of the Skarzysko ghetto, but these are pictures of the Kels ghetto where my father was. And in fact, that's the street that he lived on. So they had to leave their house and the store and relocate to the ghetto. Before they left, they managed to hide some of the jewelry in the basement and they gave some of their other valuables and photos to a neighbor to hold on to them until they could return. I doubt they realized that this was not a temporary move. Sorry. My mother, her parents, her grandparents, her aunt and cousin all lived together in a tiny one bedroom apartment on the border of the ghetto. The windows faced the border of the ghetto so they had to be sealed with wooden boards. Life was much more difficult, but my mother was an 11 year old girl who had many friends and cousins nearby so she did not feel the impact of living under these harsh conditions. In fact, my mother told a story of how one day she was supposed to go, they continued to uh, want her to get an education. She was supposed to go to a tutor and uh, she saw her cousins and they were going ice skating and they said, you know, they wanted her to join them. And she said, I don't know how to ice skate. And they said, don't worry, we'll teach you. And they took her out in the middle of the frozen whatever it was, pond, lake, um, and they uh, left her in the middle and they said, okay, now you can learn how to ice skate and go home by yourself. And she eventually got home and she was crying to her mother and her mother said, you were supposed to go to school. She had no sympathy for her. So, you know, even though they were in these horrible conditions, they were still kids. Because food was extremely limited in the ghetto, my mother would sneak out of the ghetto remove her white armband with the blue Jewish star on it and go to purchase food from a man who the family had done business with before the war. I know she didn't realize how much danger she and everybody else was in because on one of the trips on her way back to the ghetto, she realized that the man had given her too much change and she went back to him to return the change. So you can see how honest she was. And he started screaming at her, what are you doing? You gotta get back. There was an abandoned ammunition factory near the ghetto and the Nazis wanted to take it over. They were concerned that it might be booby trapped and they selected a few men, including my grandfather Pinnock to go in and check. Because Pinnock had done this, he was able to ask the, off, the SS officer for a job. This was not a paid job, but it helped save his life and eventually many others. If you were working in the ghetto, even without pay, your chances of staying alive were greater. Every evening, Pinnock would walk from the ghetto 45 minutes to the factory where he oversaw the people coming and going to work. Some were other Jews and political prisoners who were working as slave laborers, while others were local people who were paid for their work. At some point, the Nazis rounded up some of the older men in the ghetto, including Sarah's beloved grandfather Zelig, and transported them to Buchenwald concentration camp. Zelig eventually died in Buchenwald. Pinnock had 
developed a relationship with a man named Krauss, who was the Nazi SS officer in charge of the camp. In October, Krauss warned Pinnock and told him to bring his wife and his child to the factory. The next evening, Pinnock brought 12-year-old Sarah to the factory. And the following day, on October 3rd, 1942, the ghetto was cleared out. My mother's mother, Hannah, did not go with them. And in a little while, you will hear my mother describing what she learned about, what she later learned about what happened to her mom. A few of the people who were able-bodied were brought to the ammunition factory, which at that point had become a forced labor camp known as Haseg, and you can see the emblem on the screen. The people from the ghetto who were not sent to Haseg were deported to Treblinka. Treblinka was one of six killing centers and approximately 900,000 people, mostly Jews, were murdered there. Sarah's mother, Hannah, who's pictured on the screen, her grandmother, Rosa, her aunts, and her younger cousins were among the people who were killed there. I visited Treblinka when I went to Poland, and the picture shows what it looks like today. The Nazis destroyed it in late 1943 to try and cover up what occurred there. It's now a mass grave with irregular shaped stones and some of the larger ones are marked with the names of the towns where the people were deported from. And you, as you can see in the picture, I took a picture of Skarzysko. So now we will hear my mother's testimony of what happened to her mother, Hannah. And she did not learn this until later on. This was recorded in 1997. The male voice is um, her interviewer. And I want you to keep in mind that when this happened, she was almost 13 years old. I went with my father and he begged her, my mother, come with me. She said, no. Then she wanted to go with some, by herself. Then she changed her mind and she went back. She didn't want her to be with, leave her, uh, her mother and her sister. When there was the Vyshedlenie, how you say this in English? Aussiedlung? Uh, yes, deportation. Deportation, when it came to the deportation. So the Germans took some people from the town back to the camp. So my mother went over to one of the SS and she said, my husband and my daughter is there, can I go too? So he said, no, it's enough. And they pushed him in the wagon. So daddy went to Klaus and he begged him, he said, Save my wife, he said, I told you before, but I will try my best. He came back and he said, sorry, I cannot do nothing. This way I lost my mother. She didn't believe it. She, did, she didn't believe it. How, how could anyone believe what would happen? So as I previously mentioned, the factory became a forced labor camp called Hasek. And here's a map of the camp. Hasek was divided into three work areas known as Burke A, which is in blue, Burke B in green, and C in orange. Pinnock, my grandfather, was the lager elder or Jewish prisoner in charge of Burke A. And because of his position, my mother did not have to perform hard labor. But instead, she would assist her father in the office and later on in the infirmary. In 1942, my mother, Sarah, was almost 13 years old and was in a forced labor camp with her father working nonstop. The prisoners in the camp were able to wear their own clothes, but could only bathe once a month with no soap and cold water. A woman named Hanka, who had the job of cleaning the office where Pinnock worked, saw my mother and asked her if she had washed her hair. When my mother shook her head no, Hanka took care of her. Even though Hanka was only 10 years older than Sarah and was living in horrible condition, conditions, she helped her. Sarah, Pinnock, Hanka, two of Hanka's brothers and a nephew were in Hasek Skarzysko for almost two years. Hanka and Pinnock fell in love there and she became my mother's stepmother and eventually my grandmother. After the war, when my mother would hear testimony from other Holocaust survivors, she would often say, that she didn't have it as bad as others and she considered herself lucky. 
While many survivors may have suffered more than she, she did not have it easy. And I think that speaks to the positive outlook she had on life. And I think you'll agree with you, me, sorry, with me, when I share with you some of the things that occurred in Hasig Skarzysko. Some of the clothing from the people who were killed in Treblinka were brought to Hasig, and Pinnock had the task of sparingly distributing clothes to people who needed it. He found a few articles of clothing that had belonged to his wife, Hannah. He gave them to my mom, and that was how she learned that her mother had been killed. One of the men in the camp had take, uh, took a small scrap of leather that he needed to fix his shoes. He got caught by the Nazis and the whole camp was made to witness as they hung him. And my mother said that Hunka shielded her eyes with her scarf at the time. Another time, my mother was walking around the camp headed to a different section and the guard on duty did not recognize her and held a gun to her head. Fortunately, somebody saw this and told the guard who Sarah's father was and he let her go. There was a guard who used to walk around the camp and he would call his dog Mensch, meaning person, and he would tell the dog to attack the Jews, but he referred to the Jews as dogs. And now we are going to hear my mother again describing a very chilling exchange with a guard. So one day he comes wearing white gloves. He tells me, you see, I take off my white gloves, my hands are clean. Stupid me. I ask him, what do you mean? You cannot wash your hands like this. He said, I take off my gloves, my hands are clean. So he tells me, I kill people wearing the gloves. When I take off my gloves, my hands and my conscience is clean. What did you say? Nothing. What could I answer? What could I, I couldn't answer nothing. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot to unpack in that. And maybe we can discuss it further during the Q&A. Uh, you know, very often you hear people say, how could people do this to other people? And I, I, I could do a whole lesson on this. Anyway, keep in mind, my mother was only around 13 years old, was living in horrible conditions with little food, witnessed all sorts of atrocities, but she still felt lucky because she had her father and she had her father. During the summer of 1944, the tide was turning in the war and the Soviet army was advancing into Poland and the Nazis began to evacuate the camps in Eastern Poland. People were sent on cattle cars from Hasek Skarzysko to other camps. Sarah, Hanka and Pinnock were on the very last transport out of the camp. And we can hear my mother explaining that experience. And I started to cry hysteric, screaming hysteric, crying. And he asked my father, why is she screaming? What happened? Who is this woman? Why is she so screaming? So I said, <clears throat> he said, this is my daughter. He said to me, was willst du? What do you want? I said, I want to go with my father together. I don't want to be separated from my father. He said, okay. So they put some men and daddy was the last one to go in and I was holding to his pants for dear life and we went together in one wagon. You can hear the little child in her. She was holding to her father for dear life. They traveled in the cattle car for three weeks. It was crowded with 80 to 100 people in each car with only a bucket to go to the bathroom in. Occasionally they were given some bread or water. When they arrived in Leipzig, Germany, they were told that the men should remain and the women should get out. Before she got off the train, my mother gave her father one a handkerchief. handkerchief. They, the men continued on to Buchenwald concentration camp. Sarah and Hanka got out of the train and had to walk for many hours to the camp. My mother felt the bundle that she was carrying get heavier and heavier and thought, why should I give them my belongings? and she threw them on the ground. And the other women copied her, and then the guards beat them up. When they arrived in Leipzig, Hanka turned to Sarah and she said, since they didn't have any papers, let's make you older. 
And remember in the beginning, I said that she was also born in 1927. And this is when her birth year changed from being born in 1929 to 1927, making her two years older. These are copy, this is her um, ID card in Leipzig. Leipzig was a subcamp of Buchenwald. And in Europe, it's, it's day, month, year. So the 14th of November, now it's 1927. Um, and this literally saved her life. The women with the children were treated well for three days. They were given food and clothing, but after three, way, three days, they were deported to Ravensbrück concentration camp. And I inserted a clip here that I don't usually use when I um, speaking to students because I find this clip very haunting, but um, letting you view it. And she's describing what happened to the women and children. And then coming back at night, we, we were saying on the upper, and I see them, they're taking all the mothers with the children, the hair shaved in gray, awful dresses, and they took them away. They took them to Ravensbrück, we never saw them again. And I wanted my friend to stay with me. My Ahanka said, she, well, she will take care of me, she will take off her. She said, no, she wants to go with her, with her mother. And after- Which friend was that? Ida. One of my closest friends. And after the war, when I met her father, the first question was, how happened? You survived and my Ida didn't survive. And you were both the same age. I could not answer him. I started to cry and I could not answer him. Now I am sorry that I didn't tell him the truth, but I could not. On this time, I could not tell him the truth. So uh, take a deep breath here. Um, changing her birth year saved her life, and she, you know, wasn't able to explain that to this woman's father, this young girl's father, and I think she did the right thing. So it's a little out of order, but it's true to my mother. She she never told the story sequentially anyway. So now we're going to go back and hear her describe what it was like when she arrived in Leipzig. We came to the camp. Everybody was wearing the uniforms, Pashak camp. It was a very, very big building, a brick house, a very big building. They brought us there. They took us downstairs. They told us to undress. Just so we can take a towel and the shoes. So what I did, I hid in the shoe a picture of my mother. I folded and I hid it in the shoe. I still have the picture. And she had that picture with her. It was in her wallet. And that's the picture, the crumpled up picture of her mother that she kept with her the whole time in her shoe. Okay. By the time they um, arrived in Leipzig, they had already heard about Auschwitz. And they knew that people were told they were going to take a shower, but really guessed to death. So here's what my mother remembered about that process. And keep in mind, she was 14 years old at the time. They were beating us up and held it. And I was wearing a little ring, a silver ring. I could not take it off. I got such a beating because I could not take off the ring. Finally got it off. Then they took us to a, to a shower. When we came out from the shower, I said to her, Hanka, are you alive? She said, I think so. And she said, you? I said, I must be alive because I hear you talking. You see, by us, we knew showers is goodbye. Next, they were given striped uniforms to wear. My mother said they purposely gave the shorter women long uniforms and vice versa. The uniforms they were given did not fit well. One of the women had made a belt from the straw they slept on and my mother noticed this. And she told Hanka, she said, I, I can make a belt like that. So my mother would make these belts 
and Hanka would barter them for extra food. They, they were a team. Life in Haseg Leipzig was quite different for 14 year old Sarah. She no longer had a father to protect her and she lived and worked alongside the other women. They were given very little to eat, baked coffee for breakfast, soup and bread for lunch and bread for dinner. One time my mother was given a piece of bread that was moldy. I don't know what got into her, but she went to the SS officer in charge who was distributing the bread and she showed him it was inedible. And the officer showed her a, a softer side and gave her a new piece of bread. When the other women saw what happened, they too tried to get better pieces of bread and the guards beat them up. And my mother used to say that she always felt guilty about that. The work they were doing consisted of making parts for V2 rockets and the V2 rocket is pictured in the bottom. My mother was part of an assembly line and she said she felt guilty because she was helping the German army. I've heard stories of other people. In fact, there was another 2G presenter who told about how his mom sabotaged um, what they were doing, but I don't think my mother felt that she could do that. If she had, she was putting in the springs and the uh, for the rocket, and the next person could have been killed if she had sabotaged them too. So they were basically choiceless choices. My mother was a good worker, and the Nazis rewarded the good workers by giving them money, and that's what's pictured there. It was scrip; it wasn't real money, but it could be used to get a toothbrush or a comb or maybe an extra little bit, bowl of soup. And it was meant to motivate them to work harder and they just basically earned basic necessities so that they could continue working. Sarah and Hanka were in Hasig Leipzig for about eight months until March of 1945. The allied armies were getting close and the Germans were losing the war. So the women were sent out of Leipzig and sent on what is referred to as a death march. They marched aimlessly for three weeks with little food. When they passed a field or a farm, they would eat whatever they could. Many women died on the march. Hanka felt like she could not continue. And now it was my mother's turn to take care of Hanka. The guards with them figured out that it was warmer during the day. So they slept during the day and marched during the cold, dark night. They crossed the River Elbe three times before the bridge was blown up by the allies. And while they were marching, whenever the allied planes would fly above them, the guards would hide among the women in the prison uniforms so the allies wouldn't bomb them. One day they woke up and they realized that the Nazi officers were gone. A few of the women went to a German woman's home. She took them in, fed them and let them wash up. She allowed them to stay a little while. And the next day they were on the street and some young German boys with guns saw them and brought them to another concentration camp. And I think this part of the story really exemplifies the different behaviors of the different German people. This kind woman did the right thing and then these boys arrested them after they were already freed. After a couple of days in the camp, the officers commanded them to go on yet another death march. My mother knew that Hanka would not last another death march. So they hid in the kitchen of the camp with three other women. And they remained there for a few more weeks until they were finally liberated on April 26, 1945 by American soldiers. You're free, they said, but where could they go? When they were liberated, they were taken to an old school and they were allowed to pick out a dress. I can't imagine how people got reunited with their family members, but it seems like everyone would ask anyone they saw if they knew what happened to their loved ones. One day, Sarah, my mother and Hanka were on the street and they noticed some British soldiers. My mother noticed that one of the British soldiers had Palestine on his sleeve. Two of Hanka's sisters were living there. So my mother pointed that out to Hanka and when she was doing that, she was speaking in Polish. And the soldier turned around, the British soldier turned around and began speaking with them in Polish. It turned out that he was a distant cousin of her father. And before they parted ways, Hanka gave him her sister's addresses and asked him to let them know that she had survived. 
a few days later, they saw some men who they recognized. And when my mother told this story, she said she grabbed one of the guys and said excitedly, where's my father? Where's my father? And he told her to calm down and that her father would be there in a few days. And a few days later, her father arrived and they were reunited. And my grandfather showed my mother that he had kept the handkerchief that she had given him on the cattle car. How he managed to keep it with him the whole time in Buchenwald and another concentration camp is a mystery. Sorry. I'm not really clear of the sequence of events that, that followed after they were reunited. I do know that they eventually returned to Poland but they encountered difficulties along the way. They wound up in different parts of Poland because they were avoiding pogroms and other anti-Semitic acts. They eventually did go back to the house, but it was too painful for my mother to go inside. They were able to retrieve one of the two boxes of jewelry that they hid before they left. And in that box was a tiny strand of freshwater pearls that are pictured on the screen. My mother, my grandfather and Hanka did not stay in Skarzysko. Instead, they went to Chestahova, where they had some other family members, and my mother attended a Jewish school. After a few months, the teacher recommended that my mother go to a Polish school. On the day she was supposed to attend the new school, she said her throat hurt, and she continued to do that for the next few days until her father spoke with her. And remember, in the beginning, I told you she swore she would not go back to a Polish school because of what the teacher had said about a Jewish girl not needing an education. She could not face being persecuted for her religion anymore and she refused to go to that Polish school. The family left Poland in December of 1945 and this was not easy because the Soviet Union was in control and they had to bribe a guard to let them out. So my, grand my grandfather gave the guards a suitcase along with its contents as a bribe to allow them and about 20 other people on the train to cross into Germany. They went back to Germany and lived in a displaced persons camp in Salzheim, Germany. My mother was almost 16 years old at the time. Her step uncle, Hunka's brother, Joe, went to register her for school and made her two years younger. Now he changed her year of birth to 1931. Changing her birth year enabled her to catch up on her education. And this is the year of birth that was on all of her official papers. She always said she was born in 1931, even though she was really born in 1929. She reclaimed two years of a lost childhood. In fact, I did not learn that her real birth year was 1929 until the night before I got married and her uncle told me that. So here's my mother's ID card from the displaced persons camp. And you can see her birth year is 1931. I'm not sure when the family left the DP camp and moved to Frankfurt, Germany and began to rebuild their lives. Henik and Hanka got married officially and had a baby boy in 1947 named Harry and my mother became a big sister. After going to school, my mother went to a commercial school and worked as a bookkeeper in Germany. And she was the first member of her immediate family to come to the United States in 1955. She came on a ship named General Langfit. You can see her name on the manifest. Before she boarded the ship, her father gave her a bottle of vodka. And according to my mother, that bottle saved her. She shared the vodka with some sailors who told her not to go below deck and gave her some saltine crackers. And she and a few others were the only ones who did not get seasick on that voyage. When she arrived in America, she stayed with Hunka's brother's family got a job and a year later, Hinnick and Hanka and Harry joined her. And she met my father a few months later. My mother met my father because he was from Kells, Poland. My mom had gone out on a date with a man who she really didn't like. That man met my father because they had a mutual friend. They were playing cards, cards were a big part of their lives. And when um, my father was introduced to that man and told him where he was from, the man said he just went on a date with a woman from Kels. And he gave my father my mother's phone number. And a year later, they were married. 
my parents had their wedding picture on their bedroom dresser and my mother surrounded it with pictures of other, of other family members' weddings. So I'm copying her. And here is a picture of me and my husband when we got married. My sister. After the war, oh, I didn't oh, want- Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. What happened there? Please. Okay. My sister and her husband when they got married. Um, my uh, older daughter and her on her wedding day, my younger daughter on her wedding day, and my nieces. And that's my grandson attending his first virtual wedding. The last video I want to share is my mother's words of, wit of advice about handling trauma. After the war, I didn't want to talk about this. My brother is still blaming me because he said, my parents never talk about this. I said, don't blame mommy and daddy, blame me because they were not allowed to talk. But when I got married and my husband's family always talk about this, his sisters, his brother and he, they're always talking what happened and how. And I realized, and it's better to talk than to hold everything inside. I titled this a string of pearls for several reasons. Here are the pearls that were reclaimed after the war. These pearls were worn by me and my sister on our wedding days, my daughters when they became bat mitzvah and when they got married. I also see these pearls as a metaphor. These pearls are tiny and do not have knots in between them the way larger pearls are strung together. If you break the strand, they all scatter. The pearls represent the people in my mother's life. They supported her and helped her survive and thrive. They held each other together. As you heard in her story, there were acts of kindness, both large and small, which enabled her to survive. And I hope you learn from her story how important it is to be there for each other. There are many things you can learn from a Holocaust survivor. These are stories of truly remarkable people who were persecuted simply because they were Jewish. They persevered and overcame incredible odds. I want you to know that while her experience had an impact on her, it did not make her a bitter, resentful person. In fact, quite the opposite. My mother was the quintessential glass half full person who always saw the best in everyone. And I'm sure that the help of other people and people up standing up enabled her to be that optimistic person. And I'm closing with a picture of her holding hands with her great grandson, because I know her legacy will continue. And before we go to the Q&A, I would like to thank a bunch of people, get myself together here. Uh, so thank you to HMTC and Andrea and Michael for giving me this opportunity to share my mother's story. I want to thank Irving Roth of Blessed Memory, who was my friend and mentor, who I started working with when I retired. Irving created the Adopt a Survivor program that my mother participated in, and he stressed the importance of the next generation continuing to tell the story. He even had a class on how to do this. Um, he had a wonderful analogy. He said that, um, with the second gens starting to tell the story same time as, as the survivors, it was like when you do a relay race and the, um, the first runner, the second runner doesn't stand still waiting for the first runner to pass. They run alongside each other and they pass the baton to each other. And that's, you know, Irving was an amazing human being. Anyway, my sister and I would bring our mother to the Adopt a Survivor program at, at our synagogue, the Reconstructionist Synagogue of the North Shore. And we would both say, we really should write these stories down. And it was on our to-do list. And we know what happens with that. Uh, sometimes we would write down some of the stories, but not in any kind of structured way. And then when the pandemic hit, HMTC offered a class in telling your parents' stories. And that's when I finally got around to putting pen to paper. So I wanna thank Helen Turner and Thorin Tritter for all their help and guidance in that, uh, giving us that class. 
And when I was done with the class, I had asked Elise Friedman to help me insert video clips into the PowerPoint. And she really went above and beyond. She watched my mother's tape. She helped me organize the pictures and she was an amazing uh, help to put this together. So thank you. And I wanna thank everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, we're getting uh, so many thumbs ups and, <laughs> and applause. <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here. Echo full of Dinah's sentiments. Um, we do want to open up uh, the talk for Q&A. Uh, so I want to uh, ask um, everyone here if they want to share any comments or any thoughts or questions. I'd love to open up the floor to you right now. You can either use the raise hand emoji if you know how to. Uh, that signals to us that you have a question. Um, if you do raise your regular hand, we might not see it. Um, if we don't call on you, please please feel free to unmute yourself and share. And again, if you have any questions that you wanna put in the chat for me to read, um, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so I will, um, though I see we have uh, someone already with their hand raised. Uh, Joseph, um, if you'd like to uh, start us off, you can unmute yourself. Yes, first of all, I want to say it's an it was an excellent presentation. Uh, it was uh, well, very well put together. So I want to thank you for that presentation. I recently lost my mother, uh, actually on 9-11. She was 95. She was a Holocaust survivor. Um, my father was in the Jewish Brigade of the British Army, which, uh, you know, which you, to you talked about, uh, you know, meeting a person with Palestine. That was probably the, the Jewish Brigade because they did come to Europe to try to a, a revenge, uh, um, you know, have some revenge on the Germans. But I, what I want to ask you is when your mother came to the United States and sure, she was quite young with a family and it was in the 50s, you said, um, what was her reaction as she started living in the United States to some of the um, social issues that were troublesome in the United States, such as, you know, the uh, civil rights uh, movement and segregation and things like that. I, I really don't know what her reaction was. I do know that um, when I was in elementary school, I was in, I think, third grade, um, they had started busing in, um, in our school. It was an all white school and, uh, I'm sure my parents got a letter, you know, saying that this was happening and they didn't say anything to us, but the neighbor down the block had told all of us to be careful because the black children were coming to school. And, you know, it was, it was a neighbor, it was a, a friend of mine uh, who was telling me about it. My parents didn't say anything about it. So uh, I, I don't really know. Uh, my father had a, a clothing store in, um, on 116th Street in El Barrio. Um, so, and it was, the, the, the whole block was Holocaust survivors. Um, I, they really didn't talk about that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Manny, uh, you, uh, next question. You're muted, Manny. Manny, you're muted. Okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, I just want to uh, thank you. You did an excellent presentation integrating uh, the Shoah Foundation interviews as well as various documents. And um, I'm kind of sorry I didn't have the, uh, well, pleasure of uh, interviewing your mom. I was an interviewer for the Shoah Foundation, but her interview, I think, was earlier on about 1997, you said. Um, Anyway, uh, for me, it's been an honor and pleasure to know your mom because she attended so many meetings in the in uh, the Kelso Society meetings in the in those years before the pandemic, and I always found her so so soft spoken and um, just um, very pleasant. But she didn't she did not really share her personal experiences. Um, but anyway, you did an excellent job in putting everything into historic perspective. And uh, it's 
amazing that your mom was able to hold on to a photo of her mom throughout that whole experience. Um, so you have the fact that you have photos of family also is kind of amazing. And um, um, I was also wondering when you, when your mom came to the United States, did she have any sponsors in the United States or uh, was, was she any, any support from Hyas or anyone else? Yeah, she, she, uh, she was uh, through Hyas and uh, the person who supported her was uh, a friend, a family friend who uh, I guess they knew each other either in Poland or in the DP camps. I mean, she didn't come here till 1955. So they really established themselves in Germany. Um, she, was and, in camps. she was in a DP camp that long? Uh, no, they were in DP camp. She was in DP camp in Salzheim and then they lived in Frankfurt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. And um, Doug, uh, if you'd like to share your question or comment. Hi, um, I wanted to ask uh, about eight or nine years ago, I was lucky enough to see Ellie Wiesel speak in New York City. Um, and I asked him uh, back then how he felt about the different, the comparison between Vladimir Putin and Hitler. And he thought that it cheapened the whole thing. Um, it cheapened the whole comparison to Hitler. But now we're in a different world with everyone on in the Ukraine. So I want to know if you kind of saw any similarities between, you know, the, the, what happened with your, with your family, what's happening in the Ukraine uh, now. It, it's, it's, you know, when I see those pictures of um, the refugees, it's like I, I can like feel what my parents uh, went through. When I, when I, you know, I, I grew up knowing stories and, and experiencing this. Um, and I just never, and I could read Holocaust literature, but I would always kind of put up a wall and, and not envision my parents actually going through this, you know, if that makes sense, you know, like it was maybe protecting myself psychologically. Uh, but when I see these pictures on the news, it, it makes it very real. Um, you know, to me, um, I, I did change uh, something in my presentation because in respect to the Ukrainians, um, the Ukrainians were not uh, very good to, they were, a lot of survivors will tell you that the Ukrainian guards were worse than some of the Nazis. Um, and the incident when she was uh, held up at gunpoint, it was a Ukrainian guard and she says that in her testimony. Uh, but I took it out of the presentation once, um, Russia invaded, uh, the Soviet Union, inv Russia rather, invaded the Ukraine um, because it's a different world right now. It's a different Ukraine. My sister's also on this call, so she could field some of the questions too. <laughs> I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, thank you, uh, Doug, for asking that question and Dinah for for sharing those uh, uh, sentiments. With that, uh, I figured we'll give people a few minutes also to kind of get some more questions or comments. Feel free to, to share. This is for all of us to be a part of this community. Um, Dinah, when you were speaking, actually so, many, so much of this uh, reminded me of my, my grandmother, my father's mother's story. Um, my grandfather was also a Holocaust survivor. He, he passed before I was born, but my understanding is he, he didn't speak. He was a very angry man, um, had a lot of losses, obviously. My grandmother um, spoke um, about her, her experiences. Um, so you, you spoke about your mother's experiences. Um, was your, did your father have uh, experiences um, during the Holocaust? And because uh, your mother mentioned something about him and his family were sharing, and that helped her open up and start telling her story. So what was that like for your father and his family and then for your mother to start sharing her, her testimony? My, my father really did not speak about his experience much at all. My father went through Auschwitz. My father had a tattoo on his arm. His number was B298. Um, the first time I noticed his number, I was a little kid. Um, we were up in the Catskills in the bungalow colony. Um, and I said, what is that? And he was with his friends and he obviously didn't want to share anything with me at that point in time. And he told me that when he was little, he couldn't remember his phone number. So they tattooed on his arm. 
Now I was young, but I wasn't young enough. I knew that that wasn't a phone number. And I also knew that he didn't want to share it. Um, he told us a few stories here and there. His family mostly spoke about life before the war and some of his uh, siblings told their stories, um, but he really did not share much of what he went through. I, I looked it up and I found out more. He was in uh, a few concentration uh, slave labor camps. He was in Auschwitz and he was liberated from Mauthausen, which was a horrible, horrible camp. Um, and he was on his way to Italy. Uh, his brother-in-law died during the death march and he was with him the whole war. Um, and he thought he was the sole survivor and he was ready to head towards Palestine. And he met somebody who said to him, what would you give me if I have good news for you? And he said, uh, give you, I, ha I have nothing. And he said, your brothers are in Bergen-Belsen in, a, D in a, D a DP camp. And so he went back to Bergen-Belsen and he went to the DP camp there. Uh, he came from a family of nine. Uh, five of them survived, um, but he also had two brother-in-laws and a niece and a nephew, and his parents were all murdered in Treblinka. As, yeah, as folks have mentioned, you, you share your mother's testimony beautifully, and it's so touching. Um, you really speak to the history, but also make it so personal. Uh, you share this beautiful story of your mother and, and her childhood trying to uh, get out of her skipping school so we, we can see like the humanity and, and just being a child and then you also share this moment um, when this guard is wearing this white glove and saying almost how he can separate killing um, and, and going uh, about his life afterwards and your mother you said was 13 or 14 correct uh, at the time yeah what, what was all of this like? I mean, going through the experience and witnessing all of this, but to, you know, the, the psychological impact for her as a child, um, what was that like uh, for her to process? Did she ever speak about that? That, for example, that specific um, scenario that you mentioned, because her answer to the interviewer is, what can I say? Um, has she shared anything about moments like that from her experience? Uh, <sighs> Uh, I don't know if Evie can help me out on this. Um, not really. I mean, she would tell us these stories at random, you know, again, not never in any kind of sequence. And she told us the story. I don't remember if she was trying to make a point about something. Um, she, it's amazing that she wasn't more psychologically screwed up um, because she really was together and uh and and like I said she just saw the good in everybody in fact sometimes it was a little infuriating because you know there were people that you didn't think were so great and she would find something positive to say about them <laughs> you know I I don't really see you know aside from being you know they were strict parents I had a curfew, I had a call, and it they watched uh, the news at 10 o'clock and it said, do you know where your children are? So I had a call in at 10 o'clock to tell them where I was. Um, I was not allowed to join the brownies because of the color of their uniform. And I couldn't wear clogs when clogs were popular because of the wooden shoes reminded her of um, the shoes that they wore in camps. But other than that, you know, they were my parents. <laughs> I see Lisa has her hand up. <laughs> so first of all, thank you. I couldn't be more proud to be your family today. Couldn't be more proud. Your mother and father, which you know, I adored. Your father was my first tattoo. We were in the Catskills at the bungalow colony. And I remember going down the hill into the pool and the pool had steps and I was afraid of the water. So your father sat with me and I remember rubbing his tattoo. I thought it was dirt or, <laughs> ink or something. And I just remember him taking my hand and just rubbing my hand after that. I had no idea what it was. Somebody told me later and it was like, oh my goodness. Your parents were some of the most generous people I've ever met in my life. Your mother has my heart. And we didn't know her as Sarah. She was she always Saranka. Saranka, huh? <laughs> and that, right. that's, that's how, um, yes. You're incredibly brave. 
Thank you. Thing, that we're not more screwed up, right? <laughs> I think so. And, and, and Lisa's father was the one who took my mother to the ice skating pond and left I, her there. <laughs> I said that. He is that guy who would leave you in the middle and run away. But, yes. Uh, <laughs> but he loved her and he loved you guys. And thank you for doing this. Thank you. Love you. Love you too. And I uh, just want to give um, some folks just another minute if they have any questions. But I, I also wanted to ask you, Dinah, what was it like um, hearing your mother's story, uh, helping her with it, and now taking it on, as you said, um, as a 2G, sharing her testimony? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, we, we were doing with her, it kind of, it was, it, there was a, a, a sort of a smooth transition because my sister and I would take her to the adoptive survivor program and hear her tell it to the students. And sometimes, uh, you know, we would, you know, explain certain things to the kids. So it, there was a very smooth transition to doing this. And I would recommend people do that if they have the opportunity. Did uh, your father have a similar experience and did he, have any lingering psychological effects afterward or didn't your mother's positivity help him? My father was a, a joker. I mean, he would tell jokes and play practical jokes. And I think he just wanted to move on and he didn't really talk about it. Um, he did have Parkinson's and he was taking some meds that would give him nightmares. So I don't know if he was reliving some of the trauma. Um, uh, uh, he might have been more traumatized, but uh, you know they they didn't sh they didn't share it with us. I think they they played cards. They only they uh, my father did tell me uh, that people were don't show off. People are jealous. So I think that was probably you know a, a result of the how. And he also kept everything because he ne like he would walk down the street and bring home like a. a a piece of wire that he found on the street. And I'd be, why are you bringing that home? He's like, you never know when you can use it. And one time he actually used some of the, this piece of garbage that he found on the, you know, and he was like, see, you never know when you can use anything. Uh, you know, that, that, that mentality of, of saving everything and utilizing everything was there, which I didn't realize was Holocaust mentality until like, you know, uh, later on in life. Um, I've heard that before, even with food, that they were, they would hoard food to an extent uh, because they had been starved in the camps. So when they got here and saw so much food that, you know, they, it blew their minds basically. And they would hoard fruit because they hadn't seen fruit in years. Oh my. My, my father wasn't really hoarding, but he had to have soup every night for dinner, uh, which was mind blowing to me. And every meal had to have soup. And when I got married, it was July 1st um, and they weren't going to serve soup at the wedding. He had a whole discussion with the caterer because he thought they would look he would look cheap if he didn't serve soup. And I'm like, Daddy, nobody <laughs> needs soup on <laughs> July 1st. Any other questions? Donna, can I tell you my favorite stories about your mother and the doctor? Yes. <laughs> we would talk to her before she would go, and she had, I think, my three favorite ones. When I'd call her and go, what are you doing at night? She'd say, I'm going to the Holocaust. <laughs> my second favorite is, I go, what are you having for dinner? And she goes, I'm having pizza at the Holocaust. <laughs> and the number one is she baked cookies for the kids in the program, and she said, I made cookies for the Holocaust. My, my other favorite was um, what, one time she was in the hospital and the nurse was up in her room doing the intake and the TV was on and CNN was on and Wolf, Wolf Blitzer was on the screen. And she turned to the nurse and she said, I was in camp with his parents. And I'm like, okay, it wasn't sleepaway camp, you know? Well, the nurse thought it was. <laughs> You have to have a sense of humor. <laughs> I'd like to ask if anyone has any other questions or comments that they would like, and then we're I just I just wanted to 
say one thing, you know, uh, listening to, thank you, Dinah, it was wonderful listening to you. Uh, it was a great, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say my, I'm Michael's uh, dad and uh, my father also never really spoke, but uh, all through his life and he died, today is his birthday, he died 47 years ago today. And uh, he always had nightmares, always had nightmares. He, I always used to hear him screaming and screaming in the middle of the night, you know. So uh, maybe the medicine uh, got, got some of, you know, the feeling that your father suppressed. But my father basically suppressed everything. We didn't know anything about anything. And just I used to hear him screaming. And one more thing, you showed your mother's picture. My son, Michael, who's done some beautiful work with Ancestry dot com and he's found pictures for me i've never seen my grandparents on my on my father's side he just found the whole family picture of my aunts and my uncle it was just beautiful and just want to thank you for everything thank you for sharing thank you that that's the thing about certain survivors you know they they, they don't have pictures in fact that big picture from 1919 she got later on in life you know she didn't have that um, and it's amazing that you have some pictures. I, uh, one of her friends uh, who survived, um, she, we went to see her in, uh, she lived in Maryland and we went to see her and this woman showed me all these pictures that she had and she kept them with her throughout the war. And she, in various camps, at one point she hid them in the garbage and then she took them out. And the, those pictures are so meaningful to have those pictures is amazing. Um, I've seen Janet Gaines hand up before. I don't know if she's still on. Janet, do you have a question? You're muted. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering if your mom had a feeling about the German people have after the war, like if she expressed kind of shock and disbelief that they could have done it. Like my mom often remarked that, you know, how could such a cultured people have evolved to barbaric level? Did she express any of that or? She didn't really express it. Um, in fact, uh, we grew up in a, in a two family house and the first tenants uh, upstairs were German. And, um, so I, I think they held more anger towards Polish people. Right. Okay. I mean, I, well, my husband tells a story about we, we got a Mercedes and he was working with some doctors and he said, I'm taking my mother-in-law for a stress test. And he goes, what do you, what do you mean? What do you need? You know? And he goes, no, no, no. I'm taking her to the Mercedes deal. She's a Holocaust survivor and I'm taking her to the Mercedes dealer. <laughs> We have a warped sense of humor. <laughs> I'm glad she could joke about it. I mean, or take it anyway. I know we might be related because we share the same humor. About my family. <laughs> you like driving around in the Mercedes convertible, she. <laughs> but they, but but uh, you know. I did go to Poland and my mother was not thrilled about that. And my father said the only way he would go back to Poland was in a B-52 bomb. <laughs> and when we were in Poland, when we were in Kells, the you could feel the anti-Semitism there. In Skarżysko, they were fine. They were really very helpful to us. And uh, they even brought us uh, a block away from her where she had lived. There was a library and they tried to help us and they, they brought us to the library and they were trying to be helpful. And then when we went to Kells, the, you could feel it, it was palpable. What year was that? In 2016. Uh -huh. Kells is a famous city for what happened there after the war. Um, there was a pogrom in, in um, 1946, a year over a year after the war, and 42 Jews were killed in that pogrom. So nothing has changed there. Their, uh, their anti-Semitism lives I, I in I wouldn't say nothing has changed, but you know, it, it, there's, people are diverse. And the, But like I said, and, and you could feel it more in Kels than you could in other parts of Poland. Diana, thank you so much uh, for this evening, for sharing your 
your mother's testimony. And um, I just want to thank everyone for being here and being a part of the, the dialogue. Um, again, if you would like to find out more about these programs, you can visit hmpcli.org. Um, and we hope to see you at more online programs and for you to visit the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center uh, in Glen Cove. Uh, so with that, Dinah, I just wanna say again, thank you so much for, for this. Uh, Andrea and everyone at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, thank you so much for sponsoring and supporting this program so it can uh, take, uh, take flight all these years and hopefully uh, many more programs and years to come. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you. Have a good night.